Uh, yes, this is my uh, fifth time back at INR in as many years. And uh, Bill, I think I get a free sub with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, at least. <laughs> Anyhow, good morning, everybody. Welcome uh, to Vancouver, where the fresh air, the beautiful views, the medical marijuana will make you happy, but the housing prices will kill you. <laughs> so, today I'd like to talk to you about a project I've been working on for some time now. Throughout the majority of my academic career, I've been fascinated by the concept of fairness. As you know, in past conferences, I've talked about this uh, particular virtue. Now, I've developed a project which, in theory, might be very useful in dealing with uh, human disagreements. Now, whether or not it gets funded or approved, or if it's even possible, uh, these, these things are still at issue. But I'm working with various agencies to make it a reality. And the idea is to create a machine that will produce resolutions to social issues in the least biased manner. Sound impossible? Yes, maybe. But try, we must. And this is because more than any other virtue of human conception, fairness seems to garner, at least in principle, the greatest consensus of appreciation. We may not all agree with the results or consequences of a decision or a policy or a bill or a law, but if they are arrived at in a perceived fair manner, we tend to have an easier time accepting them. So, what is it, though, about unfairness that irks us so? When actions are done unfairly, we find that others have, in some way, been harmed. When injustices are committed against ours or other species, the unfairness translates to harm committed. Sometimes the unfairness takes the form of treating others differently in some way because of a trait or a lack thereof, which is irrelevant to a given context. But think for a moment as to why it is we have all gathered here this weekend. The theme of this conference is Imagine No Religion. Our collective concern lies primarily with the harm that has, is, and will occur as the result of religious belief. So in this light, the conference could more generally be called something like, imagine less harm, right? Essentially, why we have conferences like this is because they are extended thought experiments. Right? In this case, and I like thought experiments, in this case, the thought experiment is to imagine a world in which there was no religion, a title obviously taken from, from John Lennon's song, Imagine, which in itself is a series of extended thought experiments asking us to imagine alternate states of being which reflect upon what the world could be like. But when we carefully look at the basis for why we're all here, there's a much more common ground, a much more common theme. As much as we may differ in our own particular understanding and actions of secularism and free thought, there is a commonality of which we can sometimes lose sight. The commonality is ultimately based on the concept of fairness. And the best way I've found to depict this commonality is with a graph. This is something I call the T-hip law, the tolerance harm inverse proportion law. It's a long, drawn-out name. I prefer to just call it T-hip, because in Canada there's a great band called the Tragically Hip. So, <laughs> How this works is essentially if we, if we have on the y-axis degree and on, on the x we have time, and we have tolerance up here and we have harm measured down here, then as time goes on, if somebody's actions are generating very, very low harm, our tolerance tends to be fairly high. What happens universally is when we perceive the harm rising, our tolerance tends to dip, and there are going to be intersecting points, and that's when we feel obligated to speak out and to act out. So this, I think, is the most basic way that, that humanity can understand what's going on when we have disagreements. And we do have lots of disagreements. Now, to what extent should we, as secularists, care if human ideologies or worldviews are developed in an epistemically irresponsible manner, but generate very little harm? As an academic and an educator, do I have a duty to demonstrate errors in their reasoning? I may find significant flaws and fallacies in their epistemic reasoning, but does the bottom line follow 
that if they are not generating harm, should it really matter? Or matter as much? Do we, from our perceived epistemically privileged positions, allow them the luxury of their own ignorance in this regard? So, as long as the no harm principle is being observed, how much should it matter what people believe? When we look carefully at this graph, why we're really here is because we want to imagine and talk about a world with less harm caused by inequity, injustice, and unfairness. And in many cases, we have seen how harm can be generated through the manifestation of religious dogma. So we generally tend to agree that when such actions generate a sufficient amount of harm, we then have a right to speak out and oppose such actions. Having a conference like this is a way in which we can point out intersecting points on this graph, we can realize then, when those points meet, we do not have to tolerate this type of harm. We collectively can understand that there are many cases in the world where supernatural beliefs are not benign. My objection is never with a given person or group's worldview. It is always with the degree to which views treat people or other species unfairly, and in so doing, generates perceived harm. The philosophically interesting points to consider here are what counts as harm. And how do we make such determinations? Now, it's quite apparent that on the extreme end of the spectrum, intolerance, bigotry, hatred and violence is witnessed daily by groups like ISIS, Boko Haram, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. <coughs> but there are other ways in which unfairness by way of religious dogma generates harm further down the spectrum. Today I'd like to talk to you about a unique form of unfairness and discrimination. It is unique because it is directed specifically at us, unbelievers, particularly atheists, but also humanists, skeptics and free thinkers. I'm going to have to take you on a journey throughout my life a little bit. A lot of people have been talking about their lives up here, and for the first time I thought I'd let you in on a, a personal side of what I've experienced throughout my life. During my high school days, yes, that's me. <laughs> that hairstyle is going to come back. Brillo was very big. By the way, I was in grade 10 at Our Lady of Lourdes Junior High. And I was dating my current wife at that point. So. So during my high school days as a younger, white, Canadian man, I never thought I would have to face discrimination to the degree I have experienced it as an academic. Until I became an outed atheist, I had never had to worry about what I believed or what I said or how I behaved. Because my demographic luck, I lived a relatively privileged life. However, as a widely known outed atheist academic, I can tell you unequivocally that my professional career has suffered considerably because of this fact. You may believe that in the realms of academia, this type of discrimination, what I've come to call atheophobia, <laughs> would practically be non-existent. But sadly, this is not the case. And I say sadly because it is indeed unfortunate that one's life can be so disrupted and damaged by the discrimination of a handful of individuals sharing different worldviews. To be fair, there are probably millions of people who are religiously tolerant, who practice their faith in ways which are not overtly harmful to their families or friends or others, who do not happen to share their worldviews. I think that we can all agree that we want to be tolerant of people with worldviews and epistemologies different from ours. But we don't want people who, as a result of their belief systems, treat others unfairly and in so doing generate harm or suffering to others. So, when harm is generated by any ideology, religious or secular, that's when, according to the T-hip graph, our levels of tolerance begin to dip. For each of us here today who is an atheist, you may have experienced forms of discrimination. I'm sure in some ways, some of us have other stories to tell, and I'd like to hear what those are. Unlike the overt forms of religious aggression happening throughout the world, I believe that in our part of the world, there's a far more prevalent form of intolerance, which lies hidden just beneath the surface of those we might never suspect, 
like your neighbor, your grocer, your kid's teacher, your boss, your local policeman, your physician, even a family member. These people are not flying airplanes into buildings or declaring death threats against those who are not of the same faith. Instead, the, instead these people are often hidden from our view and act in an ideologically passive-aggressive manner, which is in accordance to their true beliefs. Although they may seem to be accepting of freedom of expression and appear to be advocates of ideological and political tolerance, behind closed doors, their behavior is quite different. And in some cases, you might never become aware of this type of discrimination. I'm going to give you a few examples where I've seen it occur in, in the public realm, and, and maybe you have as well, and then I'm going to tell you about some, some personal experiences. So, in my hometown of Guelph, Ontario, we had a past liberal MP. Her name was Brenda Chamberlain. Now, to be fair, I'm sure she has done a lot of great things for the city of Guelph, and I have no idea what her thoughts are uh, currently. But in 2005, a bill was introduced, Bill C-38, the Civil Marriage Act, um, basically an amend amendment to the Marriage Act to recognize same-sex marriage. Chamberlain voted against this bill, reportedly due to her religious conscience. She was put into office to represent her constituents. She claims to have acted in their interest, but Guelph is a fairly left-wing to centrist city with a, a large gay community, so I don't think she was acting in their interest. On a website called The Christian Conservative, one can read the following. Chamberlain won the seat in the sweep of 93 and has been the MP for almost 14 years. Though she represents the other side, she has stood up on several occasions and voted against things that her party supported, such as same-sex marriage. For that, I respect her. Now, what's a bit confusing about all this is that it states right in Section 3 of the bill, it is recognized that officials of religious groups are free to refuse to perform marriages that are not in accordance with their religious beliefs. So even if one is religious to the point of not recognizing same-sex marriage as acceptable, they have an opt-out clause. So it appears to be a quite fair bill, somewhat of a win-win, if you will, for those who have differing ideologies or worldviews. This apparently did not seem good enough for Ms. Chamberlain. Now, it should be noted that in 2010, we had another liberal MP representing Guelph, a gentleman named Frank Valeriot. He voted in favor of reproductive rights for women. It was based on a motion put forward by Bob Ray, which stated that the approach of the government of Canada must be based on scientific evidence, which provides that education and family planning can prevent as many as one in every three maternal deaths and that the Canadian government should refrain from advancing the failed right-wing ideologies previously imposed by the George W. Bush administration in the U.S., which made humanitarian assistant, assistance conditional upon a global gag rule that required all non-governmental organizations receiving federal funding to refrain from promoting medically sound family planning. As a Roman Catholic, Valeri discourages abortion and encourages other alternatives, such as adoption. However, he states publicly, but if during the family, family planning process, a woman concludes she has to abort, that's her decision. This is how politicians can behave fairly. They are entitled to their own beliefs, religious or otherwise, but they must also act primarily in accordance with the greater rights of the public for whom they serve. We may, may not agree with everything politicians do or say, but we can at least acknowledge when they are acting fairly. A second example comes from a CBC News release. You may have read about this. Christian medical professionals, I teach bioethics, and so this came up. Christian medical professionals are challenging Ontario's College of Physicians and Surgeons in court over a policy that requires doctors to provide or at least refer medical services even when they clash with their own personal values. Two doctors groups and five indiv individual doctors say being compelled to refer a patient for a procedure or pharmaceutical to which they object would be unconscionable for some doctors. In a statement of claim filed in Ontario Superior Court of Justice, two groups the Christian Medical and Dental Society of Canada and the Canadian Federation of Catholic Physician Societies, as well as five individual doctors, say the college's policy violates their rights under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. One of the things I talk about in class is doctors have an obligation, according to their professional standards, that if they don't wish to follow through with a procedure, 
they have to make a referral. Somebody else has to do it. What is being challenged now is the process of referring. They don't even want to refer because in so doing it compromises their religious beliefs. So, on the one hand, right, we want to be fair and not force people to act against their personal, moral, or religious beliefs. But on the other, we want to comply to the, them to comply to the guidelines governed by a regulative body, such as the College of Physicians and Surgeons. So, the fact of the matter is, why would you go into a field knowing that you're going to have to maybe act in a particular way or at least make a, re a referral in a particular way. Now, a few years back, here's a third example. My family and I went to a clinic to have my, my son's throat checked. This was in kind of uh, north of, of Toronto. While in the examination room, there was a sign on the wall and it read, I will not prescribe RU486, the morning after pill. I will not prescribe birth control, nor will I re recommend uh, abortions. Please take a Bible. And he had a box of Bibles. Um, now, having these types of metaphysical beliefs, these supernatural beliefs, in itself is not a problem. Acting on them to the point of generating harm is. Again, just as with the same-sex marriage clause, as long as physicians and surgeons can direct patients seeking treatment which conflict with their own personal religion, religious views, there shouldn't be a problem. No harm is being generated. I don't particularly do that, that service, but Dr. You know, Jane Doe, she will do it. So as long as the referral happens, fine. But what if Dr. John Doe is the only physician available for hundreds and hundreds of miles? Right? Should his freedom of religious rights trump his duties as a caregiver? So problems with fairness in terms of how we want to balance what people believe and how they act. Uh, a fourth example, a study recently came out in the Journal of Medical Ethics. It demonstrates that deeply religious doctors are almost twice as likely to prolong the end of a very sick patient's life than doctors who are atheist or agnostic. And conversely, atheist or agnostic doctors were almost twice as likely to hasten the end of a very sick patient's life than deeply religious doctors. The most religiously minded doctors were significantly less likely to have discussed end of life care decisions with their patients than other doctors. These attitudes were reflected in support for assisted dying euthanasia legislation with palliative care specialists and those with a strong faith more strongly opposed to it. So the author's conclusion is that the relationship between the values of a doctor and his or her clinical decisions needs to be considered much more than it currently is. And of course, these things tend to lie below what I call the veneer of tolerance. They lie below the radar of detection. Now, these next examples I'm going to give you, they, they've basically been imposed upon me, and I'll give you uh, a bit of uh, background information. I was uh, born, baptized, and raised a Roman Catholic, and I had the usual religious tensions growing up, you know, the Sunday evening dinner conversations and that sort of thing seeing contradictions and, and inconsistencies and whatnot. By the end of high school, I was pretty much an atheist. Now, I consider myself currently a Peronian skeptic. I define myself as an agtheist, and sufficiently ugly enough term that nobody will ever scoop me on it. <laughs> an agtheist is a, an atheist towards all world religions. They all are inconsistent, and they all contain contradictions, and I can't imagine any one of them being correct. Um, I believe that we develop ethically uh, sound uh, judgments based on reason and compassion. As a skeptic, I would be willing to change my worldview should evidence present itself, hence the tacit slight reference to agnosticism. But other than that, pretty much a full-blown atheist. Um, now, my extended family, my brothers, sisters, parents, while they were still alive, they remained Roman Catholic. I was the only one in the family to kind of stray. My mother would sometimes use examples uh, to convince me that God existed. We'd be outside, she'd be in her rose garden, she'd clip a rose, and she'd hold it up, and she'd say, you know, Christopher, how, how can you not believe that this is one of God's miracles? Look at how perfect this, you know, the argument from design, right, classic. And I said, what a beautiful accident that is. <laughs> so I eventually, you know, my mother and I would have these discussions at length while I was an undergrad over and over and over again about 
my not believing in God and her saying, yes, it has to, ha he has to exist. By the time I was in third year, my mother was getting on in age, and, and basically, I, you know, I just decided to be prudent and, and just kind of backed off a bit. Um, she was never going to change her mind, and she was going to face the most difficult day of her life, which is to die. And in her mind, she's off to the pearly gates to embrace Jesus Christ. So am I, you know, to be the one to tell her that that's not going to happen? Am I the one to tell my own mother that she's wrong, that she shouldn't believe this, that she's epistemically irresponsible? No. No. The thing was to let her go to the grave believing what she thought was real because she was not really harming anyone. Right? She raised me in the best possible way she could. I turned out to be an atheist. She still loved me. She disagreed with what I believed and I disagreed with what she believed. But we were able to, to work those, uh, those differences out. My sister, um, she's still very much uh, a practicing uh, Roman Catholic and, and believes someday I will return to the flock. And so she tells me she continues to pray for me. <laughs> and I thank her for that, you know. Go, oh, well, sure, if that's what makes you happy, that's fine. You know. Damaging me in any way. Uh, now my family, my wife and sons, we've tried, my, my wife Linda and I, we've tried to raise our kids as responsibly as we can. Instead of invoking metaphysical agencies as the source of causality and morality, we try to instill in them a sense of reason and personal responsibility. We would have no problem if either of our sons became religious or spiritual. We would, however, want them to reflect on their beliefs and examine them responsibly without simple blind faith. And should they become involved in a cult, we would certainly do our best uh, to help them realize the potential harm which could develop and get them out of it. Now, in terms of my activities uh, as an academic in, in the public sphere, I'm often asked to, to do various types of debates. And every year, uh, I get an email or I get a call to do these, these various debates. And what happens is, I say the same thing every time. Which side would you like me to take? <laughs> Only they don't laugh. If it's a phone call, there's a pause, there's dead silence. You're, you're, you're the atheist. Yeah, I'm the atheist. Yes, that's what I am. I have the mark. It's on my right butt cheek. Do you care to look? So I say, which side would you like me to take? Well, we thought you would, you would take the atheist side. I said, I can, but I don't want to. I want your speaker to take the atheist side, and I will take his or her side. In that way, I get to crawl into his skin, he gets to crawl into my skin. It's a much more collegial practice of why two people would grow up on the same planet and believe two entirely different ideologies. So why don't we switch, and it'll show an aspect of, what's the word? Fairness, right? None have ever accepted. <laughs> We're trying, and, and hopefully that, that, will, that will come up eventually, but these things don't often go the way you, you want them to go. Now, at most of the debates I've done, they've largely been peaceful. Afterwards, I've had plenty of emails, hate mail, that sort of stuff. One stalker showed up at, the, at our front door. I invited her in for tea. <laughs> My wife came home and, what are you doing? <laughs> she called the police. And, um, she was a nice woman. She had mental health issues. We got her uh, to, uh, we tried to take care of her as best we could, and I think she was harmless, but these things happen. At, at one of the debates, um, between the debate and the question and answer period, where people get to get up and, and stretch their legs and whatnot, when I came back to my podium, on my pad of paper, somebody had written the, uh, equivalent to the extension of the middle finger right across my paper. And I was like, wow, they weren't thrilled with what I had to say. <laughs> At another debate during a, a scrum afterwards, talking to various people, a Muslim gentleman held up his, his cell phone and it said, your life may be in danger. 
Now, at every one of these debates, I have a code word with security uh, so that they know if something goes down, I just have to say the code word. I said the code word, this guy took off. They tried to follow him. They, they couldn't, I was escorted to my car that night. The next day, while teaching at this university, I was walking to my class. He came around a corner and was walking right beside me to my office, saying, yeah, I want to follow up on what I was telling you last night. So he came to my office and I had one hand on the phone. He was a Muslim gentleman. And I was ready to just pretend to talk to my wife, really dialing security, saying, oh, hi, honey. Yeah, no, yeah, I'm just in my office. Yeah, I can't, room 308 on the third floor. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, just thinking about you and hoping I'm going to live to see you. <laughs> the gentleman's grief was with the fact that there were Muslim women at this debate. It was a huge debate. 2,500 people turned out to this debate. And there were some Muslim women in full hijab sitting there. And, and the gentleman was a guy named Joe Boot. I don't know if you know him, Reverend Joe Boot, an apologist. And I got him to basically state that because of his metaphysical worldview, all of these women, all these Muslim women who don't believe what he believes are going to hell. So I had him basically admit to that. And I said, you look like great women. You look like very nice people. Unfortunately, you're going to suffer for eternity because you believe in the wrong God. And this gentleman took great offense to that and said, knock it off or else. And then left my office. I called security. The head of security literally said, was it Joe Blow? Yeah, how do you know? Yeah, we've been watching him. So apparently this guy was being observed previously. Anyhow, so those have been some of my, my experiences on the, on the debating scene. In terms of personal attacks, Linda and I have been stopped in parking lots. We, we have these symbols on our cars, right? Things like this. Right? <laughs> I see we have some Trekkies. That's, that's good. And they're funny, and they're, they, 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 they're there to generate conversation. They're not there necessarily to offend, but they could be, I, I, I imagine, perceived as offensive. In, par in parking lots, people will get out and say, what, what is that thing on the back of your car? And more than often, you tell them, and they go, oh, okay. But other times, they, they don't like it. They don't like it at all. Now, our vehicles have sustained uh, significant uh, key scratches uh, over, over the years. Eggings, pumpkins at Halloween, paintball. There's Matt. <laughs> <laughs> And then this, right? I mean, it, it gets out of hand. That's our winch, back windshield, broken. You know, this is in the driveway of our home. There's the rock that the guy threw through our back windshield. Now, I've called the police on every occasion. I said, is this not an example of hate crime? Well, we have no evidence of that. And I, I said, this happens more than you, than you think. It's got to be because of these stickers, and they know who I am, and they know where I live. So what, doesn't one plus one equals two? No unless they have, you know, written in chalk or spray paint, die, atheist, die, or something, they can't do anything about it. Okay. A severe account, encounter occurred with Linda on her way uh, on, on a street in, in Guelph with the, the Jesus is Borg sign on the back of the car. A gentleman cut her off with his car, forcing her up onto the sidewalk, screamed across his 12-year-old son, what the fuck is with the idea of that fish sign on your car? And she said, to generate conversation? <laughs> he drove off. That was that. Okay. Um, I think one of the, the worst encounters we ever faced, the most dangerous encounter, yeah, it gets more dangerous than that. We were driving on the 401. This is a big highway. In Toronto and throughout the eastern part of Canada. And I coached basketball, and I had my sons and a couple of players and my wife in our van, that same van that had the windshield broken. And we were coming back from London, I think. And we were in the fast lane, the passing lane, and a van came up behind us and had its high beams on and came, kept doing this, like very close to hitting us and then backing off, and very close to hitting us and backing off. And then he came around to the side of us and shook his head 
and showed us the crucifix hanging from his rear view and nodded. And my wife gave him the peace sign. And he returned it with one less finger. <laughs> and swerved at us. And I mean, this, you think, well, this is Canada, right? We're all multicultural. We get along. This stuff doesn't happen. It does happen. And don't think it, it doesn't. Now, the final examples of, of unfairness that I experienced occurred at two different universities. Some of you will, will know at least one of these stories. In southern Ontario, I was teaching a critical thinking course in 2005. And I, I said, if we take evolutionary theory seriously, then it follows that no matter who you are, no matter what your ethnicity, every one of us had to have evolved from a common place. And what that means is, and I wrote four words on the board, we are all African. And a person in the front row said, yeah, but how do you know that? I said, that's a great question. We don't know it in terms of absolute certainty. We know it according to what science uses, which is probability. So given all the evidence we have, it's more responsible to believe that we all came from Africa than somewhere else. And she said, but, but I'm Aboriginal. And my people would disagree with that. I said, yes, of course, I, I get that. I, I'm, I study mythologies and how religions evolved and that sort of thing. So of course I appreciate that. And she said, yeah, but who's right? And I said, do you really want to go there? Yes, I do. Not your people. I said, but why don't we use this as a teachable moment? Could you bring in some elders into the class? I'll bring in some colleagues in the sciences, and we'll talk about what happens when science and cultures clash. And we can use it as uh, a debating point within the class. The class was very uh, enthusiastic about this. They applauded. They thought, this is good. This will be interesting. She didn't think it was such a good idea. So she teamed up with a couple of fundamentalist Christians, and they wrote letters to the dean. And long story short, I was up for a position for tenure, and that position went away. We sued with the union and won, but I was still out of a job and not really welcome back at that university. So I decided, how can four words, we are all African, have that kind of power to force an administration to bow to their clients? They're not students anymore. They're customers, they're clients. So I thought, I have to do something. I, I, I decided to, to put this on a, on a t-shirt. And that's the first t-shirt I ever made. So in, in 2005, I was giving a talk at the Human Behavior and Evolution Society. And I thought, I'm going to wear this shirt in a major city for the first time to generate discussion. And the conference was in Texas. <laughs> and my brother said, what are you doing? I said, philosophers have a responsibility to take ideas to the streets, not to sit in their ivory towers, to get people to think, to challenge them, to keep the conversation going. To which he said, what good is a dead philosopher? <laughs> it had mixed reviews, to be sure. But the fact of the matter is, I was denied being shortlisted and interviewed for a position, according to the collective agreement. And we sued and won, but they didn't want me. Bad as that is, it gets worse. I was hired by another university, and everybody in this university were pretty decent people. And things were going along fairly well. But again, there was a promise of tenure, promise of tenure, don't worry about it, don't worry about it, promise of tenure, promise of tenure, don't worry about it. It was at that university that I had that big debate that so many people came out. I was already had a reputation by then as being an outed academic atheist. But the problem was, I wasn't teaching accounting. I wasn't teaching engineering. I was teaching critical thinking and ethics 
to have an atheist, a known atheist, teach students how to think and how to act doesn't sit well with some people. For the most part, everybody was cool, but for some, not so much. So by the end of one of my three-year contracts where I was to be considered again for tenure, I was shown the door. And so what happened was uh, I sued for wrongful discrimination. And I went to the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario and was the first case in Canadian history, maybe the world, where a person was suing based on discrimination of creed, where the creed was atheism. The university prolonged and drew out this ordeal for two years. My wife and I nearly lost our house. We're still recovering in some respects from it. They would not settle out of court, but I think they had feared that we might go public with it. <coughs> Within the first two minutes of the trial, they settled. They could not risk this going through a lengthy trial and the press picking it up. So we won, there was a settlement. The settlement was not great, but at least it's in the books as a precedent, right? And <laughs> now, since then, there have been other examples of lost opportunities at, at various, various institutions. I have been, as you would imagine, silently blacklisted. When you sue two universities, the word gets around. <laughs> when you apply for a job, it's a oh, uh, De Carlo. There we go. Let's just move on. I was hired as a philosopher to be a bit of a pain in the ass, to be a gadfly, to be a boat rocker. That's what you're supposed to do with students. You're supposed to challenge them, right? You're supposed to get them to broaden their minds, make them think outside the box. That's what universities are supposed to do. That's what they were like when I was an undergrad. The, the, the times have changed, I'm afraid. I often thought that if I wrote a biography, the title of it would be, I am Irony Man. <laughs> I did a quick Google search on this, and somebody already put it on a t-shirt. So I'm going to change the name. I'm going to call it, Get the Tenure First. <laughs> Now, what are the effects? What, what, what are the effects on, on my family and myself, right? Without tenure, and it's highly likely I will never get tenure at this stage in my life, uh, the lives of my family, my academic career, have been severely affected because of unfair discrimination against my being an out atheist. A colleague of mine, in no uncertain terms, told me, in all confidentiality, that my reputation as an atheist will precede me in every application for a university or college position. Knowing who I was, he said, once administrators see your CV come in and do a Google search on you, they're going to see all that atheist affiliation. And it'll immediately red, raise red flags. Some, not all academic institutions, have to be careful with whom they hire. So it made me think, why? What's going on here? Why this type of discrimination against atheists, even at the academic level? What is going on here? So I, I've come up with a hypothesis. It's a three-part hypothesis. And the first part is that people believe that atheists are amoral. Not immoral, just amoral. They don't have morality. There's been a general backlash against outed atheists, which may be due to the belief that because we are atheists, right, we are amoral, drug-abusing, sex-addicted kitten jugglers <laughs> who care less for what happens to us, our loved ones, or anyone else. So we shouldn't care about how others treat us. We are absolute nihilists, completely devoid of any structured value system whatsoever. Therefore, it follows that when discrimination and unfairness is enacted upon us, it is not as bad as sexual or racial or religious discrimination because we are in a different class, a class without any concept of good or evil or right or wrong. So it's somehow not as wrong 
to discriminate against us because, let's face it, we're just so smug. Right? <laughs> we deserve it. That's Nietzsche. Without a God, how can we differentiate between values of right and wrong and good and bad? I have had students stare at me in utter disbelief, wondering how anyone could claim to know how to behave ethically without a God. They just don't get it. It's like a puppy staring in a fan, right? It's like, <laughs> what? What do you mean? Yet I work very, very hard in my professional and personal life to try to understand what ethics is all about. If we begin with a bottom-up type of approach or naturalized understanding of ourselves, sometimes this just doesn't bode well with others. A second part of the hypothesis is that I, I believe true believers discriminate against atheists because maybe in their minds they're really doing God's bidding. Right? Atheists are unbelievers. And as such, we are the farthest thing from the truth, capital T. Other true believers who are overall wrong in regards to specific other true believers are closer to the truth because at least they believe in something. Therefore, Although atheists may be prayed for, for enlightenment or deliverance, salvation or what else, when it comes to group selection, actually becoming a member of the club, we are at the back of the line. Atheists are the worst type of infidel because we are lost to all belief. Discriminating against us and treating us unfairly may simply be God's will, and it may even do us some good. The third part of the hypothesis is something I call the tenacity of supernatural believers. This is uh, Charles Sanders Peirce was a great pragmatist, philosopher, and he talked about the tenacity of religious belief. For many, beneath the veneer of tolerance lies a person who has a very solidified belief system. Right? And I believe that their system revolves around what I call the big five. Right? What can I know? Why am I here? What am I? How should I behave and what is to come of me? And the way they answer those questions differs from the way we answer them. I answer them in a naturalistic way. They answer them in a largely supernaturalistic way. And how they answer them trickles down and it affects the way in which they act within the world. How they think about euthanasia, abortion, capital punishment, all these types of things. So what I think is happening behind closed doors is that People will act in passive-aggressive ways which can drastically affect the lives of unbelievers. And they may be totally accepting of many of the natural and social sciences, but when it comes to dealing with those who purely answer the big five in a naturalistic way, the actions of intolerance beneath the veneer may actualize. And should your reputation of being an unbeliever precede you, should you be an outed atheist, you may find acts of intolerance in many walks of life. Beneath the veneer of tolerance, many take great offense to their supernaturalized understanding of the world and their place in it. So when people like us come along and we're openly atheists and have come out of the closet to our friends, family, and colleagues, it can really upset something I call their mimetic equilibrium. People like to be in their happy place. They feel good about being in that place. And when you present a challenge, it's kind of like taking the bottle from the alcoholic, right? Or the needle from the heroin addict. Religious belief clearly has a, a, a neurological effect in people's states of mind. It makes them feel good. And when you challenge that, they can react in many different ways. And sometimes they will do it in passive aggressive ways to get rid of you because you're making them feel uneasy which is exactly why Socrates and the ancient skeptics were so good at what they did. They asked the types of questions that made people uncomfortable to make them more responsible because people often acted on those beliefs and sometimes those beliefs generated harm. Now, I have a bit of a confession to make. I must confess, personally to you, if I could go back in time, I would disassociate myself from any and all connections related to free thought, skepticism, humanism, or atheism until the second after I got tenure. <laughs> <laughs> the 
My misguided belief that all academic institutions honor free thought has hurt my family and me in ways that may never be repaired. My advice to anyone here in attendance who is seeking a career in academia is to walk out that door and do not come back until you have gotten tenure. But do I want to say this? Should I have to say this? No. And yet, by simply standing here and now stating this, I bring the future of my academic career into further peril. I have successfully sued academic institutions for this type of discrimination, but in the end, I'm still out of a job. I cannot research or teach or supervise graduate students because I am an atheist. How is this fair? In the 21st century, in Canada, should one really have to hide the fact that they are an atheist? When will the time come for atheists to be recognized as equals in society? We are not to be mocked, ridiculed, or become victims of prejudice, bigotry, and discrimination, whether openly or behind closed doors. The time has come for us to receive what has been guaranteed to us by our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And so, in considering not just the injustices which have affected my family and me personally, I developed this thought experiment, this thing I call the Fairness Machine Project. Since injustices and inequities and unfairness are often the result of personal agendas, ideologies, and biases, what if we could build a decision-making machine which could reduce these frailties of the human condition? Since we all value fairness, and we can all agree that as a virtue it is one of the cornerstones of democracy, liberty, justice, equity, I've been considering whether or not it's possible to build a machine that could generate decisions more fairly than what is currently available to us. One might say that all of politics at each and every level revolves around the concept of fairness. The majority of humans tend to highly value this concept. But what is it to be fair? As members of society, how should we define, value, and act on the concept of that fairness? The idea of equity involves the fair distribution of goods, services, and so on throughout a given population. Fairness does seem to be, in many ways, one of the highest virtues in any given society because it is valued on so many levels by so many people. At what point would unfairness ever be considered virtuous? When we look at humanity as well as other species, we see there is clearly a fairness detector in us. And so the concept of fairness seems to be ubiquitous among all cultures and also throughout the animal kingdom as well. Fairness is that virtue around which most political and business interactions must revolve. What is an injustice? What does it mean to ask for reparations other than to consider that one was treated less fairly than another and in so doing suffered damages or harm in some way? So what's going to even the score? In order to treat pe people fairly, we presuppose that the information we act upon has been gathered from a reliable, fair, and balanced source, like Fox News. <laughs> But what sources are considered fair? What criteria need to be satisfied for us to consider that the information is indeed conducive to fairness? In other words, what kind of information source do we need in order to garner fairness? Could we invent a fairness machine? And if so, how would we do this? First, to develop such a machine, we need to clarify the concept of fairness itself. Right? What is it? What would a fair society look like? How would it function? These questions are not unlike the start of Plato's Republic in the search for justice or a just state. An information system would need to be comprised of material and information gathered and distributed in as least a biased manner as possible. So how do we do this? A philosopher named John Rawls once talked about the idea of a veil of ignorance. A veil of ignorance must be built into the process to assure that the reduction of bias is secured in order to safeguard against collusion or slanting due to political interests and personal agendas. 
How do we safeguard against corruption of such a machine? A least biased system of information could become a starting point for making political decisions regarding the management of human and natural resources. It could become a base level of information which could provide politicians and administrators with a fair starting point for consideration of bills and social policies. This would be invaluable in the reformation of the Canadian Senate, which needs reformation. It could potentially allow us to return to the golden age of politics, where decisions were sought in the best interest of the polis as a democracy. Cooperation would work better than individually going it alone. The fairness machine would act as a default starting position for social policies and bills and other administrative decisions. We must safeguard against bias and corruption to the system by maintaining a truly blinded process of information gathering and distribution. A constitution would have to be drafted to establish clear and fair guidelines in defense of fairness. The fairness machine must itself become a standard of fairness, which is protected against bias and corruption in an effort to produce information which can be used to generate fair social policies and decisions. I'm hoping that if this project becomes a reality, it can actually begin in the liberal arts and humanities. It will start there and then move out into the social and physical sciences. Can we build a machine that limits bias and increases fairness in, refer in reference to decisions regarding the management of human and natural resources? It will begin with philosophers discussing the concept of fairness in order to arrive at the most cogent definition we can attain. We must become aware of the many constraints which limit us. But should we not at least try to make an attempt to develop a machine which can produce a starting point for this type of discussion? It doesn't have to be the be-all and end-all, but it could eliminate an enormous amount of time and energy by having the machine, under specific parameters, make determinations that are not influenced by us. If we truly value fairness, then it appears as though we have to take humans out of the equation. At this point in our evolutionary history, we are simply too stupid, too frail, and egomaniacal to be trusted with this type of decision-making procedure. Therefore, we need a machine which has no political, uh, particular political leanings, no private or personal agendas, nothing to gain or lose, and one that acts on algorithmic principles which will generate ideas for further discussion in the least biased manner possible. So we need to develop an information system or model which allows us to consider the fairest manner in dealing with the responsible management of human and natural resources. It will begin with philosophers, but it will end with electrical engineers and computer scientists. My hope for the future development of such a machine is wishful, but I believe we have an obligation to try. Plato would certainly agree. Thank you.